welcome to the BBC Asian Network phone in with me, Nihal. One o'clock, and I would like to know from you today, would you mind if your son or daughter married someone from, oh no, a different religion? Perhaps you were that person who married someone who was not of your faith or perhaps didn't even have a faith. And how did that play out? Why did you do it? Would the easier route have been just to simply say it's not going to work? After all, what Asian hasn't been in a situation where they've just walked away from a potential husband or wife once finding out that they are of a faith that means that it would never go anywhere? Is it the bravest of the brave or is it those who are rejecting their culture and their roots to do so? I did feel really guilty, the fact that I liked him. And I thought, oh, God, I'm actually... I've got feelings for someone who I really shouldn't have feelings for. And we used to meet up every day. From there on, once we met, it was kind of like every day. I couldn't get enough of him, he couldn't get enough of me. For me, as a, as a preacher, as, as a Muslim theologian and jurist, when I see the reality on the ground, it really shakes me. I can stand on the pulpit and tell the worshippers that this is the law. The Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. But at the same time, I know the reality on the ground that it is happening. The challenge for Muslims in today's world is how to hold on to the sense of the sacred and religion, but also live in the modern world. Colchester was predominantly white and middle class. Um, I won't lie, growing up, I didn't feel like I had much exposure to other Asians. I could count on my fingers how many Asian families were around here. My parents are from Lahore in Pakistan. My dad came over in 1950. My mum came over in 1973. I never really saw myself as Asian or white or British or anything. I was just what I was. It's almost when I had, you know, a chance to be a bit more independent growing up. I'd say around sort of 15, 16, you know, that I started to question things around me and I did start to feel different. My parents are from India. We're Gujarati Muslims. We lived in a predominantly Jewish area. At home, my parents would expect me to do the traditional Indian thing, housework and all of that would be more important than the homework. Religion was an important part, I'd have to pray. Although they weren't like forceful or anything, but they always reminded me of my roots and what's important and that this life is just temporary. I'm the eldest of five. We grew up in Northwest London. My parents are from Morocco. We used to go to Morocco every year. We used to go for six weeks. Grandparents from both sides, that was my favourite time of my whole life. I'm able to connect with the Moroccan side and connect with the British side, the Muslim side, and makes me me. As a growing teenager, I didn't have any freedom. I knew Right. I wasn't to lose my virginity until I get married. I wasn't to go out drinking. So growing up, I, I had my boundaries and I knew what not to do. So there were people having parties and I just knew not to ask, just because I would never be able to go anyway. When you kind of grow up in a culture that is foreign to your parents' culture, you almost feel like you have to overcompensate. So I grew up thinking I was never Pakistani enough. I was never anything like my cousins back home. So I always felt like I was on the back foot. So I had some kind of guilt inwardly about how, how Muslim or how Asian I was. The, the challenges faced by Muslim parents are the same as those of any parents, you know, <laughs> to give your children a good education and equip them for, for life skills. But the specific issue which Muslims face in terms of integration, discrimination, increasing Islamophobia, 
in the Western world, those are extra challenges and burdens placed upon Muslim parents. It's a difficult one to, to navigate, but uh, of course, parents uh, do their best. Britain is a free, liberal society where individual freedoms are really championed, and they should be. And as we raise our families in this society, we are facing challenges which perhaps our fathers, our forefathers, never even envisaged or had to face themselves. They've got their tunnel vision that this is the way it is. You know, they've got their whole plan when their daughter was born that, you know, she's going to have an arranged marriage just as they did. But I don't think they took into consideration the fact that they're bringing me up here in London, you know, with such a multicultural society. They'd expect me to help out in the shop. They'd expect me to help out at home. You know, the time that I had coursework and things, that's when I sort of started realising that I want to do well at school and what was the point of all this education. If they're not willing to help me out by just giving me a break from cooking chapatis or whatever in the evening. I noticed a shift, certainly, in my dad um, when he expected me all of a sudden as soon as I sort of started college and it was the mixed, you know, environment. He was like, no, you need to cover your hair. My friends were like, oh, my God, what are you doing? But I'd just take it off afterwards. And I remember one time my dad came to check up on me at college and some of my friends, they're like, oh, God, you know, Faye, you need to put your... Get your headscarf on your dad's about, you know? So I had all of that. Even if I had, say, like, cousins who were boys, even then he would be protective, saying, oh, no, you know, what are you guys all playing upstairs for? Come play downstairs. He'd want to keep... He was that protective. So I suppose because of the fact that he didn't want me mixing with um, any guy, I don't know whether that sort of had a sort of rebellious effect on me. I was a very good girl growing up. I didn't do anything extremely wrong. I was kind of testing my borderlines, testing my boundaries, but a very good girl, because I used to come home, cook, clean, do my homework, go to school the next day. Sometimes I bunked, but hey, I was growing up. I remember going to Morocco on a holiday. I was um, 15 in Morocco. The second day there, or the third day, I think it was the third morning I woke up, and I get all these guests in the house. And I just thought, oh my God, they're asking if my hand in marriage is so obvious. They come with all these presents and food, and me and Hafida, my other cousin, just sat in the room, we wouldn't come out, because we knew it was one of us. One of us was going to be sold today. When they were asking for my hand in marriage and they were sitting there, do you know what? I knew the, the very moment that it was happening and I knew right up to the end, it wasn't secret. Oh, my life, my life. I was, I was begging, I was crying in front of the mum's face, in front of the dad's face, in front of all their brothers and sisters. No, he drinks. No, I'm not living in Morocco. And no, he's not coming to England. I was being a right little... I was being immature. I was being... I was doing it on purpose. I was making such a scene. I said, well, you're going shopping tomorrow for a ring and a kaftan and a wedding dress. Anyway, I went shopping, I was saying, I want them night trainers, I want that top, and I was being really English, and I was being as English as possible. I want them high heels, I want them, I want that nail varnish, and I was being, hoping that they would see that they're gonna marry a didier. His dad and my dad are brothers, so marrying a cousin even was even more of torture to me. I just thought, that's wrong. When I came back from my holidays in September, oh, I kept it a big secret. I was so hurt. Do you know, I, I stopped being my playful, happy-go-lucky self. And then another girl turned up and sat there crying one day. We both cried together about being married. I found out she was married as well. It was not, not a happy place after that. I'd, I'd go to school knowing that I've got a husband. It's really kind of shameful. It took four years to recover from that. I was trying to get the divorce, trying to get over the emotional value. I felt no value in myself that my parents had sold me so cheap, sold me so quick. 
Like, seriously, what did I do to deserve such an ugly, filthy, smelly man? When I turned 19, 20, in my university years, I felt, I felt I suddenly had to switch roles a little bit because I think the, when the subject of marriage became more apparent as I grew up, I think that's where I realised a level of conformity may be asked of me. I became less westernised, I, I wore the shawar kameez, I started cooking, I became a little bit more observant. And part of that happened because I met someone who was Pakistani and Muslim. So I work in investment banking, who was also working in the city. So I felt like we had some commonality in terms of our work, our social lives, our religion, our background. I felt like I was making everyone happy. And so for me to see my parents happy, my community happy, and I've, I think for all intents and purposes, be, for being seen to be doing the right thing culturally, it made me happy. Um, so I didn't see a conflict. I think that happened later on. As I got more involved in my career, I had more ties to it, I was enjoying it, I was getting more involved with people at work. He wanted me to give up work. He started to judge my lifestyle a little bit. At that point, I'd, I'd you know, qualified, I'd done a number of exams, my career was going from strength to strength. So I kind of started to feel the friction between my two lifestyles, a dutiful girlfriend slash fiance, then my uh, day job as a, a banker. So I think the cracks were appearing. After that first marriage is when I literally did start rebelling. I, I was not able to listen to them. Seeing what they'd done to me, I wasn't listening. That's when my stubborn years actually did happen because that's when I was doing my own thing. I thought, I've got a divorce now, I'm married and divorced. You said, when you're married and divorced, you can do whatever you want. Well, here I am, I'm married and divorced, I do whatever I want. So I would come back late, 11 o'clock, <laughs> which was late to them. Um, getting a few beatings here and there because I was not listening. But do you know what? I was rebelling even more. It got a little bit, uh, the cycle got even more twisted because the more I rebelled, the more harder they become. Being forced into a first marriage did speed up the process of trying to find my own husband. It was kind of like, I have to find my own husband before I get forced into another failed marriage. When I did call it a day, I knew it wasn't right for me. I felt immense guilt. I'd let everyone down. How I describe him was the person that I would have thought my parents had in mind for me growing up. Um, he had everything that I would have thought on paper that they wanted, so I felt incredibly guilty. I'm quite sensitive, and I think when you grow up in a dual culture, you are sensitive about offending your parents. So yeah, there was a lot of friction. And I suppose for a few years after I broke up with my ex, I went clubbing, was out in London every single night, drank, dated inappropriate men, <laughs> dated men from not from my culture, not from my religious background, but that wasn't, just me letting off steam, I, you know, I'll fully admit part of it was. I mean, I'd just been in a very constrained relationship, you know, I was trying to find out who I was. But part of me wanted to know why these things were seen as being so bad. I hadn't even had a glass of wine till 2008. But before that, I was feminently anti-alcohol, incredibly judgmental. But then, you know, it occurred to me, well, how can I judge something I haven't tried? just to see what was out there. And I think that's just part of growing up as well. It wasn't some kind of crusade to go against my upbringing. I just wanted to live life. And I wanted to be sure that next time I was with someone in a serious way, I wasn't thinking, what if? I wasn't thinking, is this the life for me? Is this something else I haven't tried? You know, I just, just didn't want to be with someone because I was told that was the right person to be with. It was, it was love at first sight. The way I see it, it was love at first sight. I thought this is too good to be true and he thought he, I was too good to be true. My parents were never aware. While I was dating him, while I was on the phone to him, while I was thinking of him, they would not have a clue. I wanted to scream it out like, mum, there's this guy and I like him and he likes me and I think I love him. 
I was 16, so we were friends. We were going to some birthday party. He was going to be there and I needed some help because I couldn't skate and he was like impressing me with his skating. So sort of went round and was skating about with him and I just sort of knew straight away the moment we sort of got talking that I liked him and I think he felt the same. And I remember when I got home, my dad was like, where have you been? And I just made out that I was doing work at college. I couldn't say that I'd been where I'd been. It was all very hush-hush. It was just me and him that knew about it. And that was all just to protect me and the fact that it would just sort of um, ruin my life at that stage. I met Greg through one of my bestest friends, who's also a musician. She sang on his album, which was amazing, and I'd heard it and I thought, this is fantastic. And he came down to Colchester because I think she sensed we'd have some kind of commonality. And I really wasn't looking for anyone at that time. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I was looking for a relationship for a very long time after my ex-fiancé. I was very relationship phobic. We had a conversation, hit it off, and it really was instantaneous. This felt, this felt real, it felt human. When I was with Anthony, the guilt would disappear. Everything's all right. You always feel a bit stronger when you're with someone that you love and you're having a good time. You kind of forget all your worries and all the pressure that you have at home. But literally, the moment I stepped through the door, it's like, two, it's like a double life. I did feel torn, really torn between the two. Just walking down the street, we'd have so many looks from people like, what kind of girl are you? It was that kind of look. Um, like I'm bringing disrespect to my family and, you know, dishonor, if you like, to my family. But I wasn't really bothered. I was strong enough to deal with that, you know? The main guilt that I had was towards my faith, really. The fact that I, sh I was doing something that I shouldn't be doing. But then, you know, I. I also had in the back of my mind, if I'm meant to be with this guy, then I will be with this guy, you know, and that's part of my faith as well. Part of the laws of Islam say that a man and a woman can only be intimate and together physically if they are married to each other. And therefore, uh, we don't have what wider society might have in terms of having boyfriends and girlfriends, having uh, a relationship before one was married to their partner. And uh, as a result, uh, when it comes to marriage within Muslim families, it's uh, very much a family affair. It's not so much about the individual. The traditional schools of, of Sharia throughout history have generally allowed men to marry outside the faith especially Jewish and Christian women, or women of the book. But generally, Muslim women were not allowed to marry outside the faith. That has been the traditional rule for, uh, for 14 centuries. Marriage has been described as half of your faith. All that remains now is for them to support each other for the rest of their lives in strengthening their relationship with God. When you have such a system in place, um, and you find a young person then suddenly um, wants to get married but is doing things very differently to how it's done, it can cause um, challenges, sometimes friction. They locked up the shop, even though it was daytime, and they took me to the back and my mum asked me if I've been doing anything I shouldn't have been doing. And I said no, and then I knew straight away that this is, you know, they know something or someone's told them something. I couldn't understand what, what how she would have found out because I was quite careful. Then she said that she found some letters when she was tidying up in my bag. And who is this Anthony? She was really... Um, really angry, really sort of vicious, saying, what the hell do you think you're playing at? And I, wouldn't, I was denying everything at first, denying everything. And I think they threatened me with, like, a broom. They had a broom there. And they said, if you don't tell us, we're going to beat you with this, so, which they didn't. 
but they did use it as a sort of talk, like, we will beat you if you don't tell us the truth. So I told them that, yes, I've been seeing, and then they just, my mum goes, I used to hold my head up so high, you're such a good daughter and you're nothing now. One day my excuses did run out and that's when I got caught. I got caught in, um, in Wembley Market. I had ice cream on my nose. Where he bent down to lick the ice cream off my nose and when he kissed me, I saw my mum behind him and I couldn't breathe. I stopped breathing. I think I really stopped breathing. It was, do you know what? I'd rather be taken by the police. Once I said I was in love with him, that was it. I mean, people thought we were selling things. There was a crowd of people, because I did, I got a slap when I was there, and, because that was not much compared to the, what was to come. That was actually minor. I, I, I had to now lie to the outside world of why I looked the way I did. You know, I wasn't Bushra no more. I could have actually had a better life. If they didn't make me twist and lie and make every corner um, far easier than being at home. See, I stopped wanting to be at home because of their silly ways. And um, it was nothing really I was doing. So it was nothing so big. All I did was fall in love. All I did was grow breasts. And all I did was grow up. I was crucified for being in love for a good three months. I don't go out don't see anyone and have my phone taken off me. No more college, no more work, no more nothing. It became home, home and home, just stay at home. I felt genuinely sorry that I'd upset my parents, but nothing, no matter how many sorries I said, they, they asked me to stop seeing him, and I said, no, I don't think I will stop seeing him. And then they just said, right, you're not going college at all anymore. You're going to start working in the shop until the day you get married. So eventually, I got to a point where I thought, I can't stay here anymore. They don't love me. They don't care. I'm just literally their slave, if you like. So I just rung up my friend one day, and I said, and I knew my parents were going to be out and I just thought, right, I've got 10 minutes to get my stuff, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes to get my stuff together and I'm just going. And then Anthony found out where I was and then convinced me to come home. It was all, it was all really stressful. I came home and I said, well, I need to go to college. I can't work in the shop. I'm not going to have an arranged marriage and I want to marry Anthony at some point. And they, they said things would be different, but they weren't, <laughs> they weren't. Most parents tend to be overprotective, maybe rightly so, and uh, I can understand that on several levels. One is the first level, which any responsible mother or father will feel their duty to God and the requirement to follow God's law. And then you have the societal and social pressures of your family, your extended family, your friends and neighbors. In most cases, it is seen as a bad thing for the parents that, oh dear, your son, your daughter is seeing somebody that they're not married to or somebody who's not Muslim. So there are all these, all these pressures. He was really fearful of my dad, just from my stories. He was panicked. And I kept telling him, the only way we're gonna be together is, is if we get married. And he'll say, no, no, I can't get married, I can't do it. And I think for one week, the longest week of my life then, we broke up, or was it four days? Something like on them lines, it felt like a week. It was four days. And he says, what have I got to do? I can't live without you. Traditionally, Muslim women were not allowed to marry outside the faith. So what's been happening for the last 30, 40 years in Britain is where Muslim women did want to marry somebody who's not Muslim it would automatically assume that he has to convert to Islam. That's the only way she can get married to him. And certainly throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s, that's what generally happened. He stepped up, he met my dad, and he says, are you willing to convert? 
And he says, yes, I'm willing to convert. We went to a mosque and we done shahada. And he's a very Catholic boy. I mean, so Catholic, he would do his Catholic thing before eating. He would do his Catholic thing before anything. He would do Easter, Lent. I mean, I didn't know much, but I, I got taught more from him. So for him to be such a strong Catholic, and he changed. And the reason why he did is he did say that we believe in exactly the same thing. There's only a few little differences. And he, he really did see it as the right religion. So it took a man and a half to have to do what he did. That was when I got married. That was the second stage of my life, and I wish I didn't do it so quick, that's all. They married me off in three months flat. It took me two years to come out to my mum about Greg, actually, because I feel like I didn't want to rock the boat till I knew myself that it was going somewhere. There was no need to drop this bombshell if it was just going to be a fly-by-night relationship. Um, or something that was just not going to work. So I felt like I owed it to myself and I owed it to Greg to give the relationship a good go before I started bringing other people into it. And also I know if I was to bring it up very early on, I know my mum would have impressed the importance of marriage early on because from her point of view, people don't necessarily date for such a long time. So, you know, there would have been pressure on us from day one to get married fairly quickly. And I wanted to give the relationship a fair go. my real appeal to young people would be, you have every right to find happiness for yourselves in your lives, to find a person that you can be married to. But in your own mind, for yourself, with your relationship with God, you should try your best to make the right choices. If you're going to go ahead and marry someone that you really, really love, but your life is going to be filled with challenges from your parents, from this, from that, from the other. It's a life of turmoil. So please don't make hasty decisions. Don't rush to make a decision. When I got married, I expected my life to obviously dramatically change, and it had. You know, see, I had a new job, new life, a new, a new house. And the freedom that I had, I could go wherever I wanted, when I wanted. It wasn't that that I was chasing no more. It was chasing just to be happy. Murtaha, in Arabic, murtaha is it just a peace. And I could never chase, I couldn't find the peace. I couldn't find the peace whatsoever, you know. I'd go to bed and I was with the man that I wanted. I was in the house that I wanted. I had the job that I wanted, but I wasn't at peace. And I know why that came down to. That came down to two people, and that was my side of my, my life, my mum and my dad. And they made one promise, and they kept that promise forevermore. We will never, ever come to your house. We will never visit you. You have made your grave. Now live in it or die in it. We don't care. Well, my mum... Before, we used to talk quite quite a bit and, you know, I'd spend time cooking with her in the kitchen. This has gone on since I was young, so we've had that time together every day in the kitchen where I'd be helping my mum for an hour plus sometimes. Before, I used to be able to confide in her and tell her everything, but this very one thing, that's the one thing I couldn't talk about, that really upset me, and I'm sure it upset my mum because she felt that she'd lost me too. At the time, I thought, how can she be so cold or not, you know, it's very upset, you know, upset me a lot. Then I sort of withdrew and I felt like anything I would say would be wrong. So I didn't, didn't open up. I didn't have anyone to talk to. The conflict with my mum, I wouldn't say we were fighting every day. It was almost like a quiet disapproval at times. I think that's the hardest thing to deal with when you do already have an, a level of guilt anyway for not conforming to what your parents want. And then she'd bring up the Quran and, you know, a Muslim girl cannot marry a non-Muslim man or, you know, aspects such as those. And I think it wasn't that I hated her for it. It was more a case of I felt like we were almost drifting apart for two people that used to be so close. There came a point where it was just too much for me, the lying and trying to sneak out. 
So I did actually tell my mum that, you know, Anthony was someone I wanted to marry and stuff, and they agreed to sort of meet him. This was probably two years into our relationship. Anthony came to the shop and they had this sort of meeting, if you like, in the shop. And they did actually like him. But then my dad was going to like um, a gathering, a Muslim gathering that evening. And I think my dad was trying to test him or either push him away or something. He said, oh, you know, if you're really interested in converting, then come with me. So he went and Anthony just remembers just sitting there in silence. And it was a bit much for him. And then the next day when I actually spoke to Anthony, I was kind of excited thinking, oh, that went well. But then Anthony was just like, he just found it all too much. Um, and he said that he doesn't think that he'd be able to convert. So that, we went backwards, a back step from there. And that's when my mum and dad thought, hold on, he's just completely backed off. He doesn't want to know now. I just remember one time my mum was really quite cross, saying, I never want you to see him again, and she made me sort of swear on the Quran, and you're not really meant to do that. But I think that they were at a point where they just couldn't take it either, that they, um, they ended up, you know, they ended up saying, you know, just swear that you'll never see him. And at that point, I was, I knew, I was forced to do that, and, they made me touch the Quran and swear over that I would never do that. And I just remember going, running upstairs to my bedroom and closing the door and crying my eyes out and praying like, Allah, I'm, I know that I'm going to see him again, so forgive me for this. Forgive me for what I've, what I've just done. We were completely on our own and we, had, we struggled a lot, we argued a lot, we blamed each other a lot for certain things. I lost a lot of weight. I was very, very, very skinny. I couldn't eat, I didn't sleep properly. I was always worried, I always felt panicked. So it's not a really nice feeling because I felt alone. His side of the family also rejected me. They thought we were boyfriend and girlfriend, and they were like, why is your girlfriend always sleeping over? Why is your girlfriend always sleeping over? And he didn't want to say, she's my wife. His parents didn't know about me because he was just scared to tell them, because he went behind their back as well. Maybe they were a little bit frightened, because that was it's all new to them as well. You know, my culture, and it's what you're used to, isn't it? I thought that maybe he wasn't that serious, possibly, over me, as I was over him. We carried on seeing each other, but there came a point where, you know, four years down the line, I'm think I just thought, where am I going with this? And we used to have lots of sort of arguments over that. Um, and I used to say that I'd go through so much for you, just trying to get out and you don't appreciate the fact that what I've just been through, to just literally climb over my dad and walk over him as he's sort of lying there saying, but, you know, Fatty, please don't go. And, and I'd be like, no, I'm going. And I, it got to that stage where I would just literally disobey my parents. One day I had enough. They were like, you think you're married, you liar. So I brought out a wedding photo. I went, there it is. Did I make this up? And that was it. There was silence. The biggest silence of my life. He said to me, like, the same as your dad is with you is exactly what I'm going to be under. It's that kind of attack. And I said to him, well, you have to tell them. And he did. He said, we've been married now for three years. Oh, the, the horror on their faces. I got the biggest lecture from his mum. You know, you're now an Ikwazi girl and you're going to do things my way and you're married into our family, which means you're going to become one of us and you've married into my... Oh, my God. And I was like, I cannot be serious. I said, I've been doing this for the past four years. They're just as strong as us. 
in, in background, in language, in culture, in traditions, they, I think, are even tougher. I mean, Moroccans versus Nigeria, for me, is, is full force. So he had it just as hard. It was two big battles we had, big fights. And this was before even the baby turned up, you know. And then when the baby turned up, that was, that was where it was torture. That was even worse. It became the biggest fight of all because it was like, she will be named Duff. And then the other side would be, no, she will be named this. And there, who's deciding my child? I mean, you decided my marriage, you decided my life. You're not going to decide my baby's life too. Enough. So she's got like four names just to please everybody. Oh, so you didn't have to heat up, you made your own one. Yeah. I was seeing Anthony for four years before I got to a stage where I said that I could no longer continue seeing him if we didn't have a future. We sort of ended it, which seemed really odd after all that stress of four years and constant battling. So I went home and I just said, fine, find me a... Uh, I, I think I was through with love or whatever. And I just said to um, my parents, just find me someone, and they did. So I got engaged to a nice guy. I knew that I was making my parents happy. I wasn't happy, and I was doing that because I thought I couldn't be with Anthony. It was only a few days after I got engaged, Anthony told his parents, and within that time, he tells me that he was, he'd stopped eating, and um, he, just gen he just looked really sort of ill, and his parents actually asked him what was wrong. And that's when he sort of broke down and said um, to his dad that, you know, he wants to be with me, but he'll have to change religion to be with me. And at that point, I think his parents just knew that, you know, he, he was, there was a spark missing from Anthony. His father said to him, well, if your mother was another faith, I'd change to be with her. And if that's what you need to do, then we accept it. And then um, Anthony found me and said that he's told his parents and he wants to marry me. So then it all changed. I'm like, oh, my God, now? You know, the day after I got engaged. You know, it was difficult. I just couldn't believe the timing. <laughs> It was only a month after that conversation, month or two, that we got married. I think we just decided we were going to get married and that's it now. We wanted to get married, so it was all really quick. I was really aware of the fact that I wanted my father to like him and get to know him. They, they'd go to mosque together and I think that sort of helped build their relationship. After we got married, uh, people in the community were really welcoming, actually, with Anthony. And I think that was just down to the fact, though, that he was he was making himself part of the community. He, he did attend mosque in the evenings with my brothers, and they accepted him. I have a very big problem at the moment, which is I'm going to go and get married in Nigeria and I'm going to have to go to a church to get married. And he says to me, I've done it for you, you have to do it for me. Because his parents still don't look at me like we are legally married. Because they got, he got married on our side, it was more of a secret wedding in their view, in their eyes. And now I'm going to have to go to Nigeria and have another wedding, which is quite frightening <laughs> people I don't know. But you know what, he's right, he done it for me, I gotta do it for him. And it's just for people to see that we're married and it's all about people. Converting someone, I, no one could ask me to convert to, to Ju Judaism, I wouldn't convert. So a church boy like this, to be Muslim, I was asking for heaven and earth. It's not, it's impossible, but he did. And he did it for the sake of love, but really his heart wasn't there. He just sort of done it anyway. He didn't want to lose me. And he'd done it 
Whether it is fake that he went to the mosque at the time, he went with great intentions. What we've noticed since the noughties is that more and more men and the women are actually saying this is not acceptable. We, we don't want half-hearted conversion or forced conversions and no man should be forced to change their religion against their will uh, unless their heart really it, unless it's a heartfelt conversion. Faith doesn't make sense if it's forced. If, you, if you're forced into a faith or to believe something, you can't actually. It's, it's a nonsense and, and it is a fake, it's a farce. We're left with only two options. One is that the Muslim woman marries outside the faith, where her husband doesn't convert to Islam. Uh, and the second is that they don't get married at all, and that this, um, this rule stops them getting married at all. We have talked about conversion. Actually, Greg's incredibly open to it. He has offered to convert already, but that's something that's still ongoing, still in flux, and I feel you know, that's, that's Greg's journey, that's not mine. If he feels that something he's interested in and something that he's felt, you know, an affinity with whilst being with me, then that's great. I, I'll be honest with you, it would make my life a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> but I don't want the hypocrisy of him converting just for the sake of it either. When somebody accepts Islam as a way of life, as a religion for themselves, it has to be done for the right reason, that is for the pleasure of God, not so that one may be married to a Muslim woman or to a Muslim man, etc. It's a space that I am very keenly keeping an eye on. I think the time has already arrived where this requires a national level of discussion amongst scholars. The small minority of people who do allow interfaith marriages are simply adapting to changing societies because it's the fundamental principle of, of Sharia and of Islam always has been that these rules are for human benefit and are supposed to promote the welfare and well-being of people. And if the rules such as stopping people getting married are not uh, promoting their welfare but actually causing them harm, they actually become very un-Islamic. Um, so, so the reformers, if you like, are recapturing the original spirit of Islam. I know that it's happened because I wanted it to happen. I could have just backed off and done exactly what my parents wanted me to, to do, but I sort of made it happen. And, you know, I would carry certain situations that happened, I might carry them around with me, but, you know, I'm not regret, I'm not sort of, remorseful or regret, I don't regret anything. I'd go through it all over again if I had to. There has to be a point of call on, on for parents to deal with, because it is heartbreaking. I can understand now I'm a parent, it's not easy. But there needs to be a point of action, like what do they do? And rather than just stay hibernated in a, in a closet because they're too embarrassed to go to the mosque and face people, it's, it's so unfair. Their religion gets... I, I, I couldn't go to the mosque for a very long time because I was so embarrassed. Oh, are you the one who married? Ah, oh, you're the one. My God, I was, I was the first one. And now it's happening a lot. Um, I guess I've, I've opened up a lot of doors, but I still, I still stand by my guns. <laughs> Everything's worked out now, but at the time, as a 17-year-old, I just thought, you know, I've really um, brought shame to them. Um, so those words, just everything that my parents said to me, they sort of stuck with me, you know, and I'm all constantly now, even as an adult, trying to, f to find sort of um, approval, if you like, you know, always, which is that. It makes me sad. My, hu my husband's always like, you know, you're your worst critic, but... Um, well, I just want to make everyone happy, you know. I don't, I, I don't like hurting anyone. I, I never wished any harm to my parents. I didn't set out to do this intentionally to them. Never set out to intentionally hurt anyone. It's not in my nature and I wouldn't do that, but, you know, 
things just happened and then and then I felt like I was completely out of my depth and didn't know what to do. My mum says to me now that I'm, you know, she couldn't wish for a better daughter, but at that time, I did, you know, when I needed to hear that, I didn't hear that. I'm meeting more and more a generation of parents who were perhaps born in this country or at least have lived in this country for three, four decades. Their attitude is very different to the attitudes of the first generation that came to this country, where now they're very openly and confidently saying, look, you know what, we've said to our son, we've said to our daughter, whenever you find somebody that you feel is the best person for you to be married, just let us know and we'll sort it out for you. So it's, I'm very encouraged by that uh, development. The new challenge now is that what if their youngster goes and finds somebody of a different religion? that they want to be married to. And especially if their daughter wants to marry, say, a Christian man, what then? And that's where the real challenge lies. The definition of a husband, the definition of a man, does that still stand? You know, in my relationship, I am the breadwinner. I'm, I'm, I'm the one that provides so if you go by the Muslim definition of a man, I'd probably meet it. So for me, if you're going to be genuinely equal, then allow me to marry someone of the book, then allow me to marry someone who's not Muslim. I think the world is a very different place to what it was. And I think we need to evolve as a religion. I feel like Islam and the Quran is very pro-equality and I feel like I could make I feel like it is accepted, but I'm not a scholar and I'm not here to sort of give those kind of <laughs> definite opinions, but I don't feel like I'm doing the worst thing in the world. I've just happened to have fallen in love with someone that wasn't a Muslim. I suppose this is a question I have asked myself. How would I react if my daughter married outside the faith? And I have to be consistent here uh, with uh, a principal stance on this, and which is, I would support my daughter fully, uh, God willing, inshallah, in, in whoever she chose to marry, um, a man that she falls in love with and, that, and he loves her and it's good for her, then uh, that will be good for her in this world and the hereafter, whatever his background. For me, if you're looking at these aspects of religion, who's the most religious? Is it the one with the label or is it the one without the label? And I think that's the struggle I'm having with my parents at the moment to see see him f as a person and not as a religious entity, <laughs> you know. I'm Muslim, let me do with my Islamic practice in my way, because I don't think I'm gonna go to hell. I haven't murdered, I haven't killed, I haven't raped, I haven't done these horrible, I don't steal. So if I'm gonna go to hellfire for marrying a black man, I guess that's a little bit backwards if you ask me. A marriage works, a couple stay together, because of the two people involved. That is the bottom line for me. It's how human beings uh, uh, work their ways out. And good people, committed people, who wish a relationship to work, will work hard at it and will find ways of making it work, even if there's differences in, in race, age, uh, religion, culture, background. And of course, there are many mixed race couples, mixed culture couples. A difference of religion should just be seen as another complicating factor, if you like, which is also a, a challenge and an opportunity, actually, to uh, learn from each other, to, to be very uh, creative, if you like, and uh, fruitful in, in that relationship. I'd say our culture is a mixed, beautiful culture. It's not Indian and it's not English. We've got a whole balance, and I think that's what's important in life. Now that I've got my own family, I think my children are really lucky with the fact that they've got the best of both worlds. They say themselves how lucky they are that they get Christmas presents and they get Eid presents and how lucky I think they feel that they're, they're blessed in that respect, that they've got um, two completely different families but, and different beliefs. But um, it works. I think it works. At 
at this time of my life, this point, I have no regrets, no guilt. I feel like I have conquered and I've got to the strength that I am today because of all the suffering that I suffered in the past. I, I don't blame anyone. I, it's just made me and my husband and my family work harder to be together more. We, we're not going to be battered down. We're happy. We, we, we smart every day. We laugh all day long because we won. <laughs>